Good morning, you guys. Um, a couple of announcements. I just want to uh, remind you of the Thanksgiving, um, community Thanksgiving service that is on Tuesday at 7 o'clock at St. Andrews. Um, and all the choirs will be singing and just a good time to uh, worship with people in the community. So keep that in mind and keep aware of this so we know what's going on this week. Uh, and I want to start us today with a verse out of John 10. Um, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And in verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Um, and when I was reading that, I was just reminded that I want to listen, listen for, for God's voice. The world is pretty loud around us calling for our attention, and we don't want to give our time, our resources, our life to things that are not of God. And so I want to focus my vo ears to hearing that voice. And so that's the challenge for this week. Um, so why don't you just greet each other in God's love, and then we'll join in singing. of your presence, holy God. 
Help us to lay aside every encumbrance so that in worship we may find you and be found by you, the one who brought us in love to this very hour. Amen. For our children's moment, especially. Nope, he's not here. Jackson. Come on up. So What's happening this week? What special day is it? Thanksgiving? Well, first of all, I'm going to read a verse from Psalms, and then we're going to have a little history lesson. What do you think about that? Hmm? The scripture is from Psalms 107, verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. So that goes right into Thanksgiving, doesn't it? That we always need to give thanks to God. Okay, here comes the history lesson. In September 1620, approximately 100 English men and women set sail for the New World aboard the, do you remember what ship it was? Have you talked about it in school that you've done pictures of? It, it was a big boat. It was called the Mayflower. You probably hear about that this week. The ship landed on the shores of what we now know as Massachusetts and anchored at Plymouth Rock. It was there that they would form the first permanent settlement in New England. More than half of the original settlers died during the first winter. Can you imagine how big that trip would have been coming across the ocean in a boat with that was a wooden boat and you know, they were in the bottom and it was a long, long trip. It was a hard trip. The native people who lived in the area around the Plymouth colony were members of various tribes of the Wampanoag people who had lived in the area for many years. Soon after settling there, the pilgrims came in contact with Squanto, an English speaking native. Squanto taught the pilgrims how to plant corn, which became an important crop, as well as where to fish and hunt. 
Our Thanksgiving holiday stems from a feast held in the autumn of 1621 by the pilgrims and the Wampanoag to celebrate the colony's first successful harvest. Thanksgiving was proclaimed an official national holiday by President Abraham Lincoln on November 26, 1863. There are many Thanksgiving traditions, but one of my favorites is the five kernels of corn tradition. Many people follow a tradition of placing five kernels of corn on the empty plate at each plate on the Thanksgiving dinner table. These five kernels of corn serve as a reminder of days when food was scarce and how God provides for our needs. Before the meal, each person removes each of the five kernels of corn from his or her plate and tells five things for which he or she has to be thankful for. So this morning, I have created some little things of five kernels of corn. And I want you to take that home. And I want you to put that on your plate on Thanksgiving Day. And maybe you have. I just need the candy corn, but I tied it with a heart ribbon so that we can have grateful hearts on Thanksgiving. But I think that's a really great idea to go around the table and have everyone give at least one thing that they're thankful for. So I'm going to give one to you. Can you, what, what are some of the things that you're thankful for? You're thankful for God. Oh, I'm really thankful for God. What else are you thankful for? What that bag? Carver, you've been telling us what you're thankful for. I heard all those things that you're thankful for. You're thankful for your mama and your grandma and grandpa and your papa, your daddy, huh? And I have a bag for you. Want it? Ooh, not so much. Well, here are some of the things that I'm thankful for. I'm thankful that God loves me. And I'm thankful that he provides for my needs. I'm thankful for all my friends. I'm thankful for this congregation. And I'm just thankful for the love that surrounds this, this church and this congregation. And may we all on this Thanksgiving day be, we are so blessed for this church and this community. And I just, I want you to know how much I appreciate all of you. So have a happy Thanksgiving. And remember when you go to the table to share your five things and make everybody at your table, because I bet your table is going to be full of people. So there'll be lots of things. Okay. Can we say a prayer? Dear God, thank you for providing for all of our needs and loving us. We love you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's having a blessed day today. All right, let's start with the prayer for illumination. O Holy Ghost, divine spirit of light and love, we consecrate to thee our understanding, our heart and our will, our whole being for time and for eternity. May our understanding be always obedient to thy heavenly inspirations and the teachings of the Holy Church, for which thou art the infallible guide. May our heart be ever inflamed with love of God and of our neighbors. May our will be ever conformed to the divine will, and may our whole life be a faithful following of the life and virtues of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom with the Father and thee, be honor and glory forever. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Our first reading today is from Colossians 1, 9 through 20. 
and it's um, on page 953 in your pew Bibles. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened, strengthened with all power according to the, his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption or forgiveness. The Son is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning of the firstborn among, from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The words of the Bible. And our Lord up above. Thank you. Thank you. Our second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 43, found on page 858 in your pew Bibles. Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Who is Jesus? That is the quintessential question for a Christian, isn't it? Well, for everyone, really, you can't decide to be a Christian or not be a Christian without asking and answering that question, right? Unless, of course, you haven't heard, which is where we come in, making sure everyone's heard, right? You know, heard the truth of who Jesus really is. The Apostle Paul, in an effort to make sure that all the people in the region of Colossae had heard, wrote a letter that was supposed to be circulated among the churches. It states, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And through him, all things were created. Not only that, but in him, all things hold together. That's a bold statement of faith, isn't it? A basic tenet of Christianity, I might add. When we look at Jesus, we 
see as much as of God as we're ever going to see this side of heaven, right? He existed before anything was created, Paul continues, and through him, God created everything in both the heavenly realms and on the earth. Christ is the head of the church, adds Paul, which is the body. He's the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, and therefore supreme over all who rise from the dead. God, in all of his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him and his death on the cross has reconciled you and me to himself. We as believers have been brought into his holy presence where we now stand holy and blameless before him without a single fault. Christ is eternal, writes Paul. He's God in the flesh. I want you to let that settle for a moment. May not be a new thought, for you, but then it might. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, remember? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was present at creation. The Father and I are one, he declares. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Still with that for just a moment. Jesus is God incarnate, God with us. Now marry that biblical truth with another. They brought him to a place called the skull, and there crucified him. And Pilate, in one final act of humiliation, nailed a sign above his head saying, this is the king of the Jews. There's a dichotomy between our readings today, isn't there? God himself here on earth, the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, the creator of the universe, all that there is, the visible image of the invisible God, the one and only in all of history in whom the fullness of God dwells eternally, was cruelly nailed to a Roman cross between two thieves. What do we do with that? And what do we do with all the people who want nothing to do with God, who would rather see him crucified? Who's Jesus? Apparently, opinions vary. Today is Christ the King Sunday in the church. Today we celebrate Jesus as King, the Lord of our lives. Thy kingdom come, remember, thy will be done, Lord, on earth, just as it is in heaven. Today is the last Sunday of the Christian calendar as well. Next Sunday we begin Advent, New Year's Day, if you will. And as a sort of wrap-up to the year, the assigned readings for today beg the ultimate question— who is this Jesus? What does it mean to confess him as Lord? And it should be an easy answer, right? I mean, we've just spent the entire year looking at him in a number of different settings. We ought to have it all figured out. We started with the cute little baby lying in a manger, adored by shepherds and wise men alike. We saw his birth on a star-filled night full of angels and heard prophecies about him and from him and saw him fulfilled. We witnessed Jesus as a 12-year-old adolescent impressing the rabbis with his brilliance, and then again as an adult with the scribes and the Pharisees. He challenged many notions of those religious elite, didn't he? We read about miracles, too, several, in fact, healing of a blind man, the calming of a storm, the feeding of 5,000 with a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. We saw lives changed, folks released from oppression, people freed from demons. We heard Jesus' brilliant teaching and his articulate exposition of the law and saw him transfigured right before our eyes, up on a mountaintop, bathed in all of his glory. His clothes became radiant. He spoke with two biblical greats, Moses and Elijah. We saw him then turn his face towards Jerusalem and all that awaited him there. So who is this one that we call Christ. Did your understanding change over the course of last year? 
Does it need adjustment now? Who's Jesus from where you stand? Because for some, he's just a seasonal thing. A sentimental holiday card, the subject of beautiful Christmas carols or a character in a holiday display. While for others, he's a theological prize fighter, a brilliant teacher and rabbi, someone who verbally knocks his intellectual opponents right to their knees. For still others, Jesus is the ultimate healer, a miracle worker, their miracle worker, someone that they can just whip out with a prayer and like a genie in a bottle. Some see Jesus as a great moral and ethical advisor, the best the world has ever known, the ultimate example to emulate each and every day of our lives. And then there are those who are more experiential, more ethereal, really, who focus on the Spirit made flesh, the incarnate Word, and what that Word does with and to their spirits. But how about you? If you were to answer that question, would you point to Jesus as a political dissident or a social reformer, a rebel or a common criminal hanging on a Roman cross? Is he a personal counselor for you, someone to share your innermost thoughts and feelings with, you know, when you're contemplative and alone? Do you follow the prosperity Jesus, the one who blesses you if you're obedient enough, or the warrior Jesus, the one who conquers all that assails you, including sin and death? Or how about the fire escape Jesus, the one who can pluck you right out of God's wrath just in the nick of time? How do you see Jesus? The titles teacher and advisor and example are easy to accept, even if difficult to live up to. And healer and miracle worker and savior are all glorious indeed. But what about king? The one who makes the rules. Or how about judge? The one who punishes you when you break them. Or how about Lord? That's a biggie. The one who governs every aspect of your entire life. That's not a popular image for some, especially today and especially here in the West. We're encouraged to be the masters of our own destiny, aren't we? And there are those who have been so intimidated or so oppressed or so controlled that they immediately rail against any image of someone in authority over them, let alone a ruler. And I get that. I do. But Scripture clearly states that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And God's God, right? I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father which brings me to my absolute favorite C.S. Lewis thought. I'll paraphrase. Jesus cannot be simply a good example or a great moral teacher. And I would add, or your genie in a bottle as if you're God. No, he's either a liar, in which case you want nothing to do with him, or he's a lunatic along the lines of someone who thinks that he's a poached egg, Lewis says. Or he is who he says he is. He's God. The one through whom everything was created. And therefore, Lord of all, including you and me. Let the magnitude of that settle for a moment. According to historians, whenever Pontius Pilate came into town, he'd do so on a huge, majestic procession designed to make a statement. The statement was, if you God followers get out of line, this entire empire will come crashing down on top of you. It was an obvious demonstration of Roman power and prestige, not to mention Roman presence. Pilate was the commander-in-chief of the Roman-occupied forces in Judea. He was Caesar's point man, the ambassador, the government representative in that region of the empire. Pilate didn't particularly care for Jerusalem. He much more preferred the pleasant climate of the coast. 
But at certain times of the year, he had to make an appearance, especially when trouble was expected. Rebellion was common. There had been numerous uprisings over the years. And from the government's perspective, people simply had to be put in their place. So Pilate would pull out all the stops and ride into town majestically at the head of a great parade. One particularly volatile time was often Passover, the celebration of freedom from oppression by the evil Egyptian empire. It was a great time for political dissidents to bust in hotheads to work up resentment against Rome. So Pilate made it a habit to ride into town the week before with a whole cohort of troops, in addition to those already stationed at Fort Antonia, right next to the Great Temple. It was a visual reminder to any potential insurgent of who's really in charge. The historian Josephus writes about one particularly bloody Passover afternoon when the Romans crucified 2,000 Jewish rebels along the roadside leading into Jerusalem, just as a reminder of who was in control. So picture Pilate's procession, legionnaires, officers, enlisted alike, Caesar's finest, cavalry and foot soldiers, trumpets and banners, all formed up into a parade. It would have been quite a sight, don't you think? And at the very center of it all rode Pilate himself on a great war horse right through the main gates of the city. The parade wound through the streets and moved towards the Temple Mount where all the dignitaries would welcome him. City leaders, priests, the religious officers of the temple, all of those who, although they were Jews, had struck a deal with the Romans, made compromises, made arrangements, all for their own personal profit. In exchange for a degree of authority over Jerusalem, they'd keep the people pacified. The Romans loved this, of course. They were willing to work with the Jewish leaders as long as everyone understood that there were limits to their freedom. They could go ahead and worship their God any way they wanted to up at the temple. In fact, all the sacrifices and the intricate ceremonies might just keep them busy and out of the trouble. They could do whatever they saw fit as long as they and their God remembered who was really in charge. Roman rule was fixed and final, absolute. And the point of this parade was a visual reminder of that. Once, though, on the other side of town, on what we call Palm Sunday, another parade formed at the very same time. It didn't start out proud or with legionnaires in the lead. The Participants were just ordinary folks, many of them women and children. Instead of banners and flags, they cut down palm branches to wave as a sign of welcome. Instead of a red carpet, they laid their cloaks down on the road. And at the center of that parade was not a cultured Roman official, but a humble rabbi bouncing along on the back of a young colt. Not one single government official turned out to welcome him, not a solitary religious leader. These were just regular people shouting, Hosanna, hail David's son. And that's how all the trouble started. You see, if this was indeed the king of the Jews, what would that do to Roman rule? If this really was a descendant of David, the founder of the nation, Israel's greatest king ever, what would that mean for Roman power? If people follow this Jesus fellow instead of the government leaders like Pilate and ultimately Caesar, what does that do to the empire? Who's really Lord? Two parades competing for loyalty, two kingdoms clashing, two different sets of politics and priorities and values, much like our world today. Who's really in charge? That's actually the question, isn't it? Who's really in charge of your world? All kinds of parades compete for your attention. The question is, in which one do you choose to march? To whom do you pledge your allegiance? Who is it that you call Lord? You know, I remember the very first date that Deb and I had 
after our daughter Cassidy was born. It was almost 40 years ago, but I'll still never forget it. It was the first time that we'd left our precious infant daughter at home with a sitter who happened to be my sister. We went out to a movie. It was called Red Dawn, the original, not the remake. Maybe you've seen it. If so, that you know how dumb that decision was. But if you haven't, let me explain. The very heartland of America was invaded by foreign governments overnight. Suddenly, everything that the people thought was safe and wholesome and right was completely gone. Some people, some of the local officials, bought into the deal, exchanging freedom for peace, just like many leaders in Jerusalem did. But others decided to resist the takeover to fight for what they believed. Imagine the passionate emotions involved. Imagine the courage it must have taken to stand up to the truth. Imagine facing that kind of persecution and yet declaring your allegiance to what you know is right. Imagine it because it could happen almost anywhere. It was a terrible choice for date night with our first child waiting back home, but it forced a deep, heartfelt, haunting question in our own minds. Are you willing to stand up for what you know is right? Are you willing to fight for and possibly die for what you believe in? As a Christian, are you willing to die for Jesus? My guess is a lot of you would actually say yes. If the situation called for it, if Jesus asked me to, I would be willing to die for him. Then how come so few of us are willing to live for him? There are all kinds of things that compete for God's kingdom. And often the easy road is just to go along and keep the peace. Less hassle, smoother sailing, conflict avoidance. I mean, why make waves? They're not going to listen to me anyway. Why be tenacious? Why stand up for what I believe? What matters is what's in my heart, right? Not what I do. But if you think like that, Is Jesus really Lord? Are you willing for Christ to be your king, but only as long as it doesn't interfere with your feeble attempts at control? Will you accept him as your judge, separating the sheep and the goats, but only as long as it doesn't require you to give up any goat-like traits that you might have or actually enjoy? Is he the savior of the world, just like he says, but only as long as you get to decide which rules apply and when, you know, like who's saved and who's not, who's a sinner and who's not. When things get tough, do you cower in fear like those who stood at the foot of the cross or hide away in the upper room like the frightened disciples? Do you run away either verbally, if not physically, denying even knowing him like Peter in Pilate's courtyard? Are you like Herod, demanding a miracle in order to believe, or like the thief on the cross who immediately accepts him in faith? Or are you more like Pilate himself, who simply washes his hands of the entire affair? Do you, quote, find no basis to what people say about this man? Are you willing even, in a mocking gesture, maybe to write, This is the king of the Jews, but then treat him as if he's not? Eugene Peterson's The Message paraphrases Colossians like this. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade, he's supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood poured down from the cross. 
He was supreme in the beginning, leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end, the firstborn over all who rise from the dead. And that demands a decision, doesn't it? A question asked and answered, who is this Jesus to you? And all of God's people said, amen. I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts as we stand and sing. Will you please stand?
Each week we come together as a family of God and we share with one another both our joys and our concerns and lift them up before the Lord in prayer. There are a number of prayer requests on the back of your bulletin, and I invite you to take these folks with you and to pray for them by name this upcoming week. We have a number of additions. Bob Bodell uh, was hospitalized this week. Uh, he has uh, congestive heart failure. He's home now um, and doing better, but we need to keep him lifted up. Tom Massell had back surgery this week. He's home now and doing well, but keep him in your prayers. Doug Erdman had surgery this past week and starts chemo on Tuesday, so we'd like to keep him lifted up before the Lord. Are there others that we would like to share? Quiet morning. Where? Jackson? Were you waving at me, buddy? No? Nope. Okay. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Michael. Prayers for Sue Crum, uh, healing from uh, torn meniscus. I will keep her lifted up. Thank you. Seeing no others, could we be in a spirit of silent prayer? Oh, holy God, thank you for blessing us and for being in our lives. Thank you for touching our spirits with your Holy Spirit, our hearts with your love, our minds with your wisdom, and our lives with your power. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing your grace to abound here on earth and for surrounding us with thankfulness for it. Lord, we praise you and worship you as our creator and our redeemer and our sustainer. We praise and worship you not for what you do, though, but rather for who you are. We exalt your holy name above all things and offer all honor and glory to you. As your people, Lord, we know that we're called to action and obedience in your name. Help us now to faithfully answer that call. Open our eyes so that we might see your plan and your purpose. Open our ears so that we might hear your still, quiet whisper and recognize the calling out of your people for justice and mercy. Open our hearts, Lord, so that we might freely express true love and overwhelming compassion, all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And please, Father, open our minds today and always so that we'll truly know the best ways to serve your kingdom here and now. Father, it is as your people that we thank you for what you've done for us in the past and what you will do as you walk with us in the days ahead. Together, we ask you to hold us close to your heart and place a hedge of protection around our lives. As a people, Lord, we ask you to grant us peace and healing in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones as well. And we ask for a special blessing for those that we lift up now in prayer. Lord, please be with Bob Bodell and with Tom Massell and with Doug Erdman and with Sue Crum. Please be with those who are on our prayer list right now and those who are silently on our hearts. Father, it is in your son's name that we ask these things and it's in his name that we lift up now the very prayer that he's taught us saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
in several of our readings today throughout Scripture, really, we hear of being thankful, of celebrating, of rejoicing, of just having a heart full of praise for the Lord and all that He's done. We're approaching Thanksgiving, and we have indeed so much to be thankful for. Jenny's children's moment just helps point that out. This is the table of Thanksgiving. We come here because of the gifts given to us by God. Come with thankful hearts today and always. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this special time in our faith, a time when we must come before you and closely examine ourselves, and in doing so, we are to eat the bread and drink the cup. We thank you because as we carefully reflect upon myself, we know that we are unworthy of this. Yet you love us enough to allow us to eat the bread, which represents the body, and to drink the wine, which represents your blood. Amen. That he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after blessing and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he gave this to his disciples. And he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me. Everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is welcome at this table. Just come forward, break off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup and partake, and gather around our sanctuary for our closing benediction. Come, for all things are now ready. He became sin who knew no sin. i
I'd like to remind you that elders are available to talk with you or pray for you after this service. And that if today's not convenient, they'd love to hear from you throughout the week. Our benediction today comes from uh, the third chapter of Colossians, verse 15 and following. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen.